thing. Can we just turn to Psalm 149 for a moment? Verse 1. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise in the assembly of the saints. Are we in the assembly of the saints? Anybody? Okay. Let total freedom rejoice in their maker. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name with a what? With a what? A dance. A dance. A dance. A dance. A D-A-N-C-E. You know, David danced before the ark in his underwear. We have under armor, you know. <laughs> dance. Just a little shuffle, you know, whatever. A dance. Shake the dust off, you know. Shake anything else off. A dance. It's warfare. The carnal mind doesn't understand warfare. It's warfare. You know that, uh, especially the tribes and the Indians, they did a warfare dance before they went to war. There is a dance that brings glory to God. It's a warfare dance. Does everybody get it? What prevents you from dancing? Fear. Pride. Well, fear protects pride. Let them praise his name with a what? Dance. Let them sing praises to him with the timbrel and harp. That's clap. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautif beautify the what? Humble. Takes the, you know, you got to eat some humble pie when you dance, man. You, you know, it doesn't mean you're a perfect dancer. You're not in tune sometimes, you know. We, we, some, some people dance way out of tune. But you know what? God honors that dance, whether you're in tune or not. <laughs> and it brings joy to everyone else when you're out of tune. Everybody laughs. It's funny. <laughs> it's cool, man, but you're dancing. I love it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 5, let the saints be joyful in the glory realm. Because the glory realm comes by worship. It comes by dance. You're actually dancing yourself into the presence of God. Let them sing aloud on their bed. Well, heck, you're out of bed. You ought to sing louder. This is important. Let the high praises of God be in their what? In their mouth. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth. And the two-edged sword in their hand. In other words, he's trying to tell you. This is spiritual warfare. Without a high praises of God in your mouth, there ain't no sword. You carry nothing but seed. To do what? Execute vengeance on the nation, the punishments on the peoples, and to bind their kings, principalities, with chains, and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute on them the written judgment. Well, who wrote that judgment? God. So he's asking to, who's asking to, who's he asking to execute it? Us. Do you understand that we are disobedient when we don't execute the judgments of God? How do we execute the judgments of God? Praise and worship and dance. The Bible says he ambushes our enemies, right? He said to execute on them the written judgment. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. Now, I, I'm sharing this because it is a way to advance. There are three chambers of the tab tabernacle that we talked about already, right? There's the outer court, holy place, most holy place. Each one has a level of praise. Each one has a level of praise. So there's the outer court praise. And until you reach the second court praise, you can't get in there. I don't care how much word you have and how much you can me memorize. It's an area of humbleness in God's presence. Why? Because the third chamber you are invited in. That's when you are invited in. 
And God invites. What does it say? He says, I search those who will worship me in truth and spirit. The Father does. When he sees that, there's an invitation into the most holy place. That's the third dimension. See, each chamber represents a dimension. There's a level of anointing in each chamber. That's why some people have never reached that level that God has tried to get them to. In Galatians 6, verse 7. You ever see somebody, you know, standing around a pool? You know, they they're kind of don't want to get in yet. They put their little toe in there and ooh, you know. It's wet. You know. But that's like in the river. That's like getting in God's presence. Some people gotta get pushed in. Because they're too much in the way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 7. Do not be what? Deceived. God's not mocked for whatever man sows. He's going to reap it. So is disobedience rebellion? Is rebellion from God or from the enemy? From the enemy. Is it witchcraft? Oh, yes. It opens the door. He who sows to the flesh will reap flesh or reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So when you worship the Lord, are you sowing in the flesh or in the Spirit? Spirit, so you're going to reap life. Amen? And let us not grow weary while doing this, doing good. For in due season, you're going to reap if you don't lose heart, if you don't quit. So God is not looking at how you feel. He's looking whether you're obedient or not, or you're disciplined or not. Discipline goes beyond how you feel. Without discipline, you cannot be obedient, and you can't maintain the foundation of a routine that God has given us. You know, we sow in the flesh, you know, we call that react. Amen? But there are some who can respond <laughs> or react in a response. So when you respond, you're supposed to be sowing in the flesh. But God knows the intent. See, you can, be, you can be like responding, but the intent is react. Everybody get it? Hallelujah. So there's react and respond. Many can react in a responsive way and deceive many, but God knows the intent of the heart. You can't escape that. You will reap whether you react it or respond. If the intent is incorrect. Has everybody got it? Nobody escapes it. Nobody gets away with nothing. You can attempt to, but you're not going to. And Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ... For it is the power of God to salvation. It is the power of God to salvation. I'm going to say that it is the power of God. In other words, it is the anointing of God. It is the presence, the eternal presence, power, and truth of God. To salvation. For everyone who believes, what's the word believe mean? Follows. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the, right, for in the, in the righteousness of God is revealed... From faith to faith, as it is written, the just live by faith. Faith, F-A-I-T-H, forever attached in the heavenlies. Your faith is your connection. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness and the loss of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Hmm. Pretty interesting. Again, faith is your connection to his presence forever attached in the heavenlies. We have no excuse. They became veiled. I'm going to say veiled. Because they did know, but because they, they began to walk away, became rebellious, re began to reject what God was saying, they became veiled, blinded, more and more and more. They became, they became veiled in their minds and in their hearts. In Hebrews chapter 12. How many know the devil wants to blind you? It's called veiled. We were born blind. But by the Spirit of God, we become came were able to see but I also believe that there's a process and there's more than one veil there's multiple veils that's why there's three chambers there's three veils then each chamber represents a veil and a dimension Hebrews 12 verse 25 let's speak it see that you do not what Refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape, who refused him who spoke on earth. Now what is, he, what is he talking about? If they did not refuse him who spoke on earth. When Jesus came, right? All right. Much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. So him speaking from earth started the first shaking. <laughs> Started the first what? Shaking. I'm going to explain this more. Then, after he was risen from the dead, his spoken, his words from heaven created the second shaking. We'll talk more about that. Verse 26, look at. Whose voice then shook the earth. Hello. But now he has promised, because he's talking about the first shaking. But now he has promised, saying, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also the what? Heavens. That means there's a second shaking. We are in the second shaking. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Again, God spoke on earth the first shaking. Then when he speaks from heaven, that is known as the sh second shaking, which we are in right now. Go to Matthew 27, verse 50. We're not a part of the third shaking. Hello, thank God. Verse 50, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple, which is, is the temple, the tabernacle, yes, was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth did what? Quake. Again, this is, he's explaining the first shaking. And the rocks were what? Split. And the graves were open, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep during Jesus' ministry were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, 
they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Hallelujah. Again, the veil of the temple is known as the tabernacle that was torn. The earth quaked. The rocks were split. This was the first shaking, releasing those bound by the veil of reality. Now, I want you to understand something, that these veils were always preventing a reality, the true reality. The enemy blinds us, but there are three realities of God. There are three dimensions of God. There are three heavens. Paul said I was taken up to the third heaven. So these are areas that we have access to. The more you know him, there's a different reality that begins to manifest. The more you're in his presence and his glory, there's the presence. Hello? There's a glory and there's a power. Those are different realities to you. There, there's scales that in these areas of... The, especially in the chambers of the three, there's the scales come off. I believe that there's three scales that need to be removed from us, and we are in the process. That's why when a person becomes a believer right away, they don't see the things that you see yet. They got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and that's a process of removing the veils. And the enemy tries to attempt to put those veils back on so we become blinded again. Is everybody okay? Again, the first shaking was releasing those bound by the veil of reality on with a new life reality into another dimension. The tabernacle has three veils, three realities, and three dimensions. In Acts chapter 9. I'd like to call this the reality veil, but... The veil of reality, either way you want to call it. Why? Because these veils, when, they're, when you penetrate them, becomes another reality for you. That's why the third chamber is the third dimension. Amen? That's why we want to we wanna work to become third dimensional warriors. Acts 9, verse 3. Saul, who became Paul, it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone after him around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground. In other words, he was shaken and heard a voice saying to him, why? Because this is a part of the second shaking. Does everybody get this? What happened to Saul happened to me. Except for I was taken. I wasn't riding a horse or a Harley. I was taken. I was abducted. But I was just shaken and a quaking, let me tell you. Hallelujah. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goad. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I guess after that kind of encounter, you'd say, Lord, what do you want me to do? <laughs> and the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Again, I mean, this was a, excuse me, that was a part of the second shaking. Did I say first? Okay. So this is the second. Remember the first shaking, amen, of the earth quaked, the rocks were split, the graves were open. Boom, Jesus resurrected, went to heaven. And then the voice came from heaven, which is a part of the second shaking, which we are in continuously now. Hallelujah. Verse 17. The Lord spoke to Ananias and said, Go see Saul. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appear, appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your what? Sight and be what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like what? Scales or a veil. And he received his sight at once and he arose and was what? And he was baptized. Again, scale or blinders are the true reality. 
I believe that the, the veils or, or scales, there are three of them that need to be removed from individuals. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Let me tell you, the level of your worship will be determined what chamber you live in or what, what chamber you're associated with and how much reality. The more the presence of God, the more the anointing of God, the more the reality. The more the reality. When you have the high reality of who he is, you have an identity that no one can shake. You can say, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a son of God, but you're still easily shaken until you reach that level. There's a lot of mouth, but no power. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction or our challenges, our trials, our testing, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Why? It's bringing death to self. Remember we talked about the third level of death? Because each chamber is a level of death also. The more dead you are, the more access you have. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are what? Eternal. Temporary realm and eternal realm. Afflictions from the unseen that want to deceive us, harm us, divide us, medicate us, steal from us, enslave us with lust, and destroy our inner identity and then kill us before we know the truth of his existence or of their existence. Does everybody get it? See, there are many believers who still not have the reality of the unseen. They're still more, what more, they live more in the physical than they do in the spiritual. So they're more emotionally they're more carnal. They live more in the outer court. I don't care if they're baptized and praying the Holy Ghost. They can still live in the outer court. Again, your level of worship determines what court you are associated with. Go to 1 John chapter 3. You know, I've heard of so many people that have fallen. And the reason they have fallen is because they don't stay assembled and connected. But there is a level of faith in the chamber and a connection. Because what does the Bible say? That your faith is what overcomes, right? So you have, a, have to have a level of faith. One day I share with you, the Lord said to me, I want you to ask me to give you the level of faith that reaches my yes. I said, okay, Lord, give me the level of faith that reaches your yes. Let me tell you, all week long, everything was a yes. And for some reason, I stopped. I don't know why. <laughs> and then I remember, he said, look at When I bring it to you, ask. Because there's something important. Grant me the level of faith that reaches your yes. I had a great week. Although I have a good week every week. It doesn't matter. Hallelujah. First John chapter 3, verse 7. Let's speak it. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the what? Devil. It's rebellion sin. Why? Because sin is the presence of evil, isn't it? It's influencing an individual. For the devil's sinned from the beginning. 
For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. <laughs> Jesus came forth that he may destroy the works of the devil by the first and second shaking, tearing the veil of false reality. And now he wants to continue the second shaking with our cooperation. Remember, this is a military operation, not a religious one. Jesus is the Lord of the army. And so many people are caught in this religious stuff. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? And not military. That's why, we, look at the outer court is Holy Ghost boot camp. You get through, you make it to the second, second chamber, the holy place, where you become a priest, where you minister to the Lord, where your level of worship is ministering to the Lord. You are now ministering to the Lord. You live to minister to the Lord. It is great joy to minister to the Lord. And as you continue to minister to the Lord, whenever he chooses, he invites you into the third chamber. When you enter the third chamber, it's a totally different rea reality and it's a totally different dimension. You are lost. It's a spirit to spirit. Not mind to mind. The mind's not in there at all. You'd be mindless, finally. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, with our cooperation of our continuous battle, we are the end time generation that will expose, pursue, and destroy our enemy, which is God's enemy. That's why we are to be known as third dimensional warriors. There's a third dimensional warrior in your prayer booklet. Go to Revelation 12. Man, when that veil ripped, a whole different reality came. Think about that. Everything changed. Now every people have it. Now that's why you know nobody can come to the Father except for through the Son. It's amazing that all of these religions that you know the powers of darkness conjure up. Islam, Buddhism, all kinds of religions out there. But there's only one way home. There's only one name, Jesus, that can access you to the eternal port. You can't go up any other way. Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in the heaven any longer. In other words, they were no longer hidden. But they did not prevail, nor was a place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Again, in this, they will be forced out of hiding. Uh, it, as the as second shaking continues. Because the veil will be ripped away, scales will be removed. Listen, they're also forced out of hiding. There's two areas that will happen. They will be pushed into, out of their realm. But another thing is going to happen is many people, the veils will be removed for them. And they will see like they've never seen before. They will see the powers of darkness, the wickedness. They will see the fallen angels. Remember, God is doing nothing more than restoring what was in the garden. Adam saw the angels and spoke to them face to face. They served Adam. Even the serpent was in the garden. 
Hello? They came to serve Adam. The Lord said, okay, Adam, I want you to name the animals. Everything's in your hands now. I've given you this. And even the angels had to submit to Adam. Does everybody understand that? God gave Adam authority over everything. So the fallen angels were in the garden serving Adam. Hello? The serpent was in the garden. That's why he was in the garden. He wasn't there to hang out and be a friend. He was a servant to Adam until he deceived him. Then he took his place. Praise God. Again, this non-human race of reptilian origin that manipulates the thoughts and minds and desires and perceptions of humanity so that they s use them to serve their purpose and their agenda. They establish in the hearts of mankind greed, lust, or the eye lust of the flesh and pride of life. They destroy families. They take captives. They take people captivity with technology. In other words, this whole unseen battle of the forces of evil that have been influencing humanity for generations is now coming to an exposure time of the end, not saying that they'll be done with, but the exposing of them, the veil, the reality veil, will be begin to diminish more and more and more as time goes on and we get closer and closer and closer to the Lord's return. Remember, the Bible says that all will see the Lord's return. That means the veils have to be ripped away. Is everybody all right? 2 Corinthians 4. We are a part of this generation of the Lord's return. We are the forerunners. We are in the spirit of Elijah. There will be manifestation of Joseph ministries all over the place. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 3, let's speak it. But even if our gospel is what? Veiled or blinded. It is veiled to those who are what? Perishing. Why? Because they can't see it. Whose minds, the God of this age, who is the devil, Satan, the, you know, the powers of darkness, has blinded. They, he's blinded them. Those veils are still there. Who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine on them. The God of this age has veiled or blinded the thoughts or the insight of individuals and taken them captives in a temporary realm. This is all demonic influence. It's constant. If you could zip away the, the veil, the natural veil, and walk into the spirit, you would see many things. But God gives us, I call night vision. Because it's looking into the dark so that you and I can see. Even the prophets, what did he say? What do you see? That's where you want to ask for, Lord, grant me sight. Remove any scales from me, any veils that have been placed upon me that I don't know about. Amen? Remove them from me. And anything that's associated with them, I repent. If I've brought these veils on myself, by my thoughts, my agreements, my mouth, my disobedience, my rebellion, I mean, look at the devil's always looking to slap a veil on you. Why do we, look at, I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked with someone and their whole countenance is different. Because they've been taken captive and that veil is there now. And you can't counsel a demon. You've got to remove it. You, they will not accept anything you've got to say. 
I've had people come up to me uh, three weeks later, or the Lord told me to move, uh, leave. Well you, well, you made a covenant with God for nine months. No, no, no. He told me to leave. Their confidence is gone. There's no open eyes. It's gone. That demon has taken them over now. They never made it through deliverance. And even after they've gone through deliverance, when that spirit comes back and convinces an individual, the first thing he does is veil them. In their mind, and in their eyes, and in their heart. And you can't counsel them no matter what you say. You got to pray with them and get rid of it. They got to they gotta come to the reality themselves. In Ephesians chapter 1. Could you imagine if the whole world became unveiled? Snap. <laughs> That'd have to be a tremendous outpouring. <laughs> And they saw what you saw? Yes. Verse 15, please. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Now look at verse 18. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the, in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, might and dominion in every name, That is named not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Again, eyes of understanding. This is removing of those layers of veils or those scales. That, that's what Paul was praying. He's, remember, this letter is written to believers, not unbelievers. He's praying, it's saying, look at I pray that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened. In other words, that more would you be, be able to see. That means that they got to remove those scales, those veils that are there. Ephesians 5, start at 6. Let no one what? Deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Well, to walk as a child of light, you better be able to see. Amen? For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with unfruitful works of darkness. Why? Because you'll get veiled again. But what? Rather expose them. The Bible says don't associate with them. Why? Because associations bring what? Impartation. I see so many people fall just... As soon as they got their phone, within a week later, boom. They started communicating with old people, agreeing with things, and the devil put the veils back on. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are what? They're evil. We are in an evil time of exposure. Exposed. I'm going to close at Mark 16. Hallelujah. You know, I say I have to do this when somebody says something stupid. I ask them, who told you that? Remember, making what is unseen to become seen as a part of our ministry. We live to do that. 
Amen. We live to worship. What was Jesus' function? He came to what? Make what is unseen to become seen. In verse 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be what? Condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will what? Cast out. Why is that the first thing? <laughs> Think about that. Why is that the first thing? That's the first thing he says. This is what they'll do. How many believers do this? That's what we're called to do. Heck, better look in the mirror and start casting out your own devils. Amen? If you start seeing them wink at you, you better get rid of them. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, not go shopping. They will speak with new tongues. That's called tongues of God. That doesn't mean they're going to go learn another language and go to school for that. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the gift of tongues. That's the second thing he talks about. They will take up serpents. Hello, serpents, accursed. The animals that are cursed. Serpents are cursed. They carry a presence. They carry a demon. And I chase every snake that I can and behead it. I'm sure you heard the testimony when we went over a friend of ours' house. Wait, is it, if we got invited over a friend's house we hadn't seen in years. And he had the snake in this big aquarium. This thing was this thick. I mean, it was like huge. It's like, what the heck? And, you know, we just, my wife and I were, we were babies, you know, in Christ. And so he, my wife was like, oh, I want to pet him. I'm like, man, don't. Don't touch that sucker. I think it's evil and wicked and stinks. And so, she, but I didn't say anything. So I was just speaking. I, and so uh, I'm thinking, Lord, what's, what? What am I going to do with this? He said, just bind the spirit. And I said, all right. So I bound the spirit. And so this thing, she, she goes to, now it was all over my friend's shoulder. And he goes to hand it to my wife. As soon as it went in my wife's hand, this thing went, <laughs> rolled up an old ball. It was froze. He's going, what did you do to my snake? What did you do to my snake? I'm, thinking, I'm cracking up. Man. I'm thinking, Thank you, Jesus, for the anointing. Thank you, Lord, for the power to bind and loose. That snake rolled up like it froze to death. Didn't do nothing. He took it from my wife, put it in its aquarium. And we left. We were like, man, this is phenomenal, Lord. We love this stuff. I'm going to go bind every snake I see. <laughs> and uh, I, did, I didn't hear from it. He, he said it took about... I don't know, eight, six, eight hours for that snake to unwind again. <laughs> I thought, wow, that is so powerful. Now think about that. People have all these, and he used to let this thing, he put it in the closet, a, a, a bedroom, and shut the door and put a, a something underneath the door so he couldn't get out, and he'd throw mice in there, and the snake would eat it, chase it and eat it. I'm telling you, this was not a small snake. I thought it was pretty sick. So it says, we will pick up serpents, snakes. I've had to chase many of them out. So we used to, if I'd see a snake, I'd behead it. One of our, one day, one of our guys was chasing a snake out of the front of, out of the discipleship house with a knife. And his probation officer showed up. I was like, oh, God, no. We had to explain that one. <laughs> Anyways, here's the probation officer. Just happened to be walking up the driveway. He's running out the house snake. Anyways. Praise God. <laughs> but yeah, we're to cast out devils, man. And look at you don't have to go in front of a person to cast out a devil. 
you are seated in heavenly places. You can cast out a devil anywhere. There's no distance or time between you and those demons. Does everybody get it? Hallelujah. What else does it say? And we, if, they, if we drink anything deadly, you by no means hurt us. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to go test God. Amen? Siphon gas, drink cyanide, stuff like that. Because you will die. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Recover is a process. It can be a miracle or recover. In fact, even when we lay hands on people and pray for healing for them, sometimes God tells them, stop eating this and start taking this. Because it's a process of healing. It will recover. Is everybody okay? I really believe we have entered the beginning of the end. It's the end of the new season. End of this age. We're coming closer and closer and closer. And God is raising up third dimensional warriors to fight. Because if you're not in a battle, you become a casualty. And I really believe that's the lack of training in the body of Christ is warfare. Worship. We should love God's presence more than anything. There should be no hesitation when it comes to worship. But again, it's a process because you got to die. The more you're dead, the more you come alive in God. Amen. I didn't, believe me, I didn't. I, it didn't happen overnight. You know, sometimes people, little hand, you know, it finally comes out of their pocket. They wave to God, you know. Then they do half mass because they're not dead yet. Then they raise one hand. Uh, and then finally, you know, finally as they begin to reach more and more and they begin to surrender and they die more than themselves are surrendered. Yes. I don't know what they're afraid of, you know. Yes. Yes. Let's see. It's yes. Not no. Yes. No. Maybe. Yes. No. Maybe. Later. Hello. Yes. Everyone go yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for <laughs> Hallelujah. We don't do no. We do what? We don't do maybe. We do yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, we give you all glory and honor and praise. We thank you for your word and revelation and impartation and preparation because you are the God who sets strategies for his people. You never leave us in the dark. You bring us in the light. And Lord, we want to get ready for what you're getting, getting ready to do big time. So grant us eyes to see through, ears to hear through, and a heart to follow. And let your name be glorified as we say yes to you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.